Welcome to Divinely Inspired Ideas for Life. I'm Leslie McNulty, and today in our Life and Spirituality segments, we will discuss the very important topic of apathy. In the Idea Zone, we will explore defining your dream. We also include a special interview with an innovator and an initiator of amazing children's programs, Dr. Leela Bose. So, let's get started. At about 3.20 a.m. on March 13, 1964, a 28-year-old manager in Queens, New York, returned to her quiet residential neighborhood, parked her car, and she began to walk the 30 yards to her door. Noticing a man at the far end of the parking lot, she paused. When he started toward her, she turned the other way and tried to reach a police call box. The man caught and stabbed her. She started screaming that she'd been stabbed and screaming for help. Lights went on in the apartment building across the street. Windows open. One man called out, let that girl alone. The assailant shrugged and walked away. Windows closed and lights went out. I want to ask you a question today. Who can you reach out to in your world and show them that you care? What family member, student, or coworker needs a kind or helping hand? The assailant returned and attacked Genovese again. This time she screamed, I'm dying, I'm dying. This time, lots more windows opened and lots more lights went on. The assailant walked to his car and drove away, leaving Miss Genovese to crawl along the street to her apartment building and somehow she managed to drag herself inside. The assailant returned a third time, found Genovese on the floor at the foot of her stairs and finally succeeded in killing her. During those three separate attacks over the course of 35 minutes, not one of Kitty Genovese's neighbors tried to intervene. No burly neighbor dashed outside to save her life. Worse than that, of the more than 30 people who saw at least one of the attacks and heard Genovese screams and pleas for help, not one of them even called the police. After much deliberation and one phone call to a friend for advice, one man finally urged another neighbor to call authorities, which she did. Police arrived in two minutes, but by then it was too late. Interviewed afterward, the residents hesitantly admitted, I didn't want to get involved, or I didn't want my husband to get involved. One said he was too tired to call police and had gone back to bed. Several couldn't say why they hadn't helped. Many of them said they'd been afraid to call. They couldn't say why. Within the safety of their own homes, they'd been afraid to call the police, even anonymously. Many of you have heard this story before. That incident may be the defining moment of urban apathy in the latter half of the 20th century. When it happened, many thought the incident shocking, bizarre, not typical of the way people would respond. It was the kind of thing that would only happen in a big, bad place like New York City. What was wrong with those people anyway? Albert Einstein said, The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. Knowing the results of apathy, how do you and I overcome it? First, we have to understand it. What is apathy? They observed, but they did not act. They knew, but they did not care. They heard, but they did not respond. They thought of themselves rather than thinking of others. Are you a part of the collective they? 
Helen Keller said, science may have found a cure for most evils, but it has found no remedy for the worst of them all, the apathy of human beings. It cost one human life to wake up 30 families. What will it cost you to wake up? How many destinies can be changed when you and I emerge from apathy to action? Consider it. Wherever you are today, you and I have power to initiate change. It does not matter your sex, your age, or your culture. Just as Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Helen Keller overcame apathetic concern for their causes, you and I can discover renewed hope and expectation. Why wait? Let's do it now. There's more to come. Stay with us as Dr. Leslie returns with a special studio guest. You know, as, as I'm thinking of those of you who are watching today, I have just recently read statistics that yes. in, uh, in India, some official statistics say that 35% of the population is below the poverty line. Right. Other organizations that would be considered less official right. have indicated that those numbers approach 50, 60, and even 65%. That's true, you're right. And so, uh, with holistic transformation, yeah. you are addressing a very big need in the nation. You are right, yes. So tell me a little bit more, because the idea that you have for this five loaves and two fishes goes much further yes. than a, a hot food. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in this program, what we do, we provide them very good, nutritious support, and then tutoring to the students and also all spiritual mentorship. For instance, most of the parents, they are illiterate. So they cannot take care of uh, the homework or tutoring of the students. So with the help of the volunteers, students, we take care of them. We help them to do their homework. Uh, if they have any questions, they can ask. These people will clear it. Then we provide them lunch. Above all, we teach them the Bible and they have to by heart at least one verse every day. So we build up their spiritual life, their academic life, their social life, and we see they see a kind of development in their own personality, reaching to greater heights, heights in the days to come. Dr. Leela. Yes. Now tell me, I have seen the faces of these precious Indian children. They are so beautiful. Share with us the testimony of one of the young people that has been impacted by the Five Loaves, Two Fish program. Yeah, we have started, my husband started a church in a slum area. Uh -huh. And then later I found children going over on the streets without going to school and without any aim, you know. Mm -hmm. Then I wanted to do something with these children. Mm -hmm. Then I shared my vision with my husband. So we have started church there, and we have to meet the spirit, physical needs of the children also. Then I, I shared with him, I want, I want to start a school. Uh -huh. and then we started school with 60 children in a big slum. In it's a big slum. Big slum. So there are murderers in that slum, gamblers, and uh, what uh, everything is there. Now, now see, that's hard for me to imagine. Yeah. That yeah. in, I have been to your church, yes. yeah. to your school, yes. to your seminary, mm -hmm. and I would, I must tell you that the community around all three of these organizations has really been transformed. Transformed. Yeah. You are right. 
Jensen. It is not the same. I, I did not see it as a slum. Yes. And I, I would not guess that there were murderers mm. and gamblers. Yes. Yeah. No more, no. No, no, more. No, 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 no more. more. No. no more. And then what happened? Um, and these parents, they are uneducated and they don't know the value of education. Mm -hmm. Then when I shared my vision with my husband, he supported me 100%. And I started a school with 60 students in a 60. church. So six days it was a school, and seventh day it was a church. Oh my. So <laughs> now that, that, way, that yeah. expanded your budget quite that a bit, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> so nothing. When I started my school, there uh -huh. was nothing, not nothing. even an inch of land for us. You know? My goodness. Then later God started adding bit by bit uh -huh. on this land, and then he gave us uh, four rooms, you know with asbestos sheets and other things. Mm. Then I started. Then these students, what they do, uh, they go for begging. I saw them begging, going the to the house, begging the food, begging food, okay. to house to house, carrying their plates. Then I shared with my husband, see these students, they are going house to house for food. Why don't we feed them? Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so literally the children would just Carry, yeah, carry their carry the empty plates. They, empty go plates. they go around the houses. They stand. Most of them. Most of them. Now that sounds mm. actually like a, a, a very humble way yeah. to do yeah. that. Humble, yeah. So uh, for the, our viewers mm. that are listening today, you began uh, an educational institution there mm. at the church. Yeah, after the, the church. church. Yes. With those 60 students. 60 students. Yes. But that has expanded mm. into hundreds of students, students. today. Yes. How many students do you have now? Now we have 700 students and God has given us very big buildings. My goodness. Yeah, Joyce made help to construct those buildings. Uh -huh. And 700 students now from kindergarten to plus two. Mm -hmm. And these students, they excel well in their academics. Mm -hmm. Not in the school exams, but government conducts 10th class exams and plus one, plus two exams. And uh, they excel well on par with at their corporate colleges and corporate schools. Mm -hmm. If you're watching today, I want you to, to recognize we're talking mm -hmm. about holistic transformation. transformation. We're talking about a, a school that was begun in a church institution mm -hmm. that started with 60 students mm -hmm. that now yeah. has several hundred. And what this school is doing, it is meeting the natural needs by providing food, mm -hmm. providing education. But as she also said, Dr. Leela Bose, that they are hitting the top marks in the government mm -hmm. standards mm -hmm. for education. And not only that, it has to be bringing tremendous impact yes. to the families right. and to the communities. You are right. Because when you educate a child, yes. you impact a the family, family. Yes. and a community. community. There's more to come. We'll be right back with our second Life and Spirituality segment. You can help feed and educate 12,000 needy children every day. This nourishment and tutoring is a key to a better future for each child and for India. Join our Five Loaves and Two Fish project today. Apathy is the success neutralizer, the inhibitor of dreams, the limiter of realization, and the thief of progress or life. Where apathy exists, we find low expectation because initiative is lost, inhibiting our relationships and our opportunity in life. In one of our large events in Africa, we were told by the organizers, don't expect to start on time. Here in Africa, the opening night is just a test run where we work out our problems. Can you imagine? 75,000 people are preparing to gather. People are already standing on the field hours before the meetings are to begin. Yet, the expectation of a group of adult men was, don't worry, if we don't start on time, well, we never do. So, in other words, failure is acceptable. Ask yourself a simple question. 
Where have I set the standard for my life? Is failure my expectation or is overcoming the impossible where I set my goal in life? How would you handle a situation like this if in just a matter of an hour you were to address this crowd and you had no lights and no sound? Action was required. So we fired the 30 organizers and asked for 40 14-year-old male volunteers. Why? They had not yet experienced failure. They would climb where no one else would climb, lifting lights and scaling poles. Are you willing to scale insurmountable odds? If those 40 boys had not stepped to the line, what would have happened that night? 75,000 people who came looking for hope, searching for a miracle, and expecting good news would have left disappointed. Apathy comes for many reasons, an expectation of failure, insensitivity to injustice, and a sense of helplessness. Did you know that apathy has a song made famous by the American singer Doris Day? Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. You see, you can kill motivation by surrendering your emotions, your will, and your expectation to a fatalistic philosophy of whatever, whenever, or whoever. The psalmist said, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. Albert Hubbard said, Positive anything is better than negative nothing. While living in Russia in the first few months, we saw three drunks fall out of buses onto the curb. One day, as we were headed to a church to speak, we stumbled on a man comatose, bleeding in the snow. The sense of hopelessness was overwhelming as we searched for help. Finally, someone agreed to notify the police. How could we head to a church to help people if we were indifferent to hurting humanity around us? Martin Luther King said, In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Nothing is more deafening than silence when people turn an apathetic eye towards humanity. But you and I can make a difference in our world. Your actions count. Today, let's make a decision to help someone we know, someone trapped by tragedy, poverty, or hopelessness without life. Next up, we will discuss the value of associating with those around us in our Connecting to Others segment. Why is evangelism important to the church? And why is it important to the modern church? I like what this individual said. The mark of a great church is not its seating capacity, but it's its sending capacity. Have you considered that? So many of us mark <clears throat> our accomplishment by the size of, size of our building, the size of our organization, the size of our ministry. If you're an individual, you might mark your effectiveness by the number of people you have witnessed to or the number of people that you have won to the Lord. I don't think that God is holding that type of standard. I believe that the capacity of the great church is our ability to mobilize people just like you and me to get out there with the good news and give us the tools that make it very easy to do. I'd ask you this question today. When you consider the importance of evangelism to the modern church, I would ask you, as well as any church leader or any congregation, are we gazing or are we engaging? Another way we could say it is simply, are you a spectator <clears throat> or are you a participator? When Jesus was making his ascension after his resurrection and after he had spent time with his disciples, <clears throat> they were looking intently into the sky as Jesus was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. 
And they said these words, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus you, whom you have seen has been taken from you will come back in the same way. You know, the great question that many people are asking and have asked throughout the ages is simply this, move God, move. And we sometimes as evangelists laugh when we hear that statement because we say people are wondering why God isn't moving and perhaps God is wondering why people are not moving. You and I can be the solution to that problem simply by being the ones who are willing to move on the behalf of God. Now, I remember this, that when we initiated a great evangelism movement across the ex-Soviet territories, and as I stood there in the grounds that were around me, and do you, you have moments in your life that will mark you, and they'll mark your ministry, and they'll mark your understanding of evangelism. But as I stood there and I watched the crowds coming over the hill, and if you can understand the way the buildings were in that hour, it looked like the 1950s in the United States. And we were putting up tents. And so the young musicians from these from Belarus, they struck up the piano and it sounded literally like blue grass music that you would hear in the central part of the United States. And then I looked down and I'm walking on this straw, you know, it, just as the old tent of revivalists might have done a generation before. And then I looked up across the hill as I saw the people walking down the hills to come to the tent. And I heard someone say this, isn't it amazing how God is moving. And I looked around at all of those young people who were there. And I looked at all of those tents that our partners had purchased. And I looked at all of the struggle and the people who had been involved in getting those tents through borders and clearing customs and making the opportunity for evangelism possible. And I thought, yes, God, you empowered us to do this, but we moved on your behalf. So I encourage you today to recognize that the importance of evangelism is not that the church will do it, it's not that someone else will do it someday, but you and I have been empowered by God to be His voice, to be His hands, to be His heart in this world today. Stay with us. We'll be right back with today's Idea Zone. How do you unlock the dream that's in your heart? Do you have an idea, but you don't know where to begin? Or perhaps you think you're too busy or you lack inspiration. Discover a great new future in Leslie's powerful seven-step dream sheet. Dr. McNulty's free workbook will help you eliminate the mental clutter and launch your dream. Request your free copy of the Live Your Dream workbook at www.lesliemcnulty.com now. Welcome to the Idea Zone, where inspiration daily energizes action. We are on step number four of my seven step series, Live Your Dream. Today, we will learn the importance of instilling vision in others. I want to look briefly at three words, magnetic, magnanimous, and majestic. Is your vision magnetic? Is it attracting interest from others? Is it drawing resources to you? Regardless of your socioeconomic status, the world around you has extra resource looking to be employed and your vision will provide a roadmap for resource and people to travel along. Ask yourself, what am I attracting to my vision? Is it what I want? Is it what I'm expecting? Your second word, magnanimous. Are you generous of spirit? It will take quite a bit of generosity of spirit, time and talent to get you to your destination. The word magnanimous means to be royal in nature, noble in character, capable of gracious behavior. Are you forgiving, charitable? Learn to think like nobility. You will need these characteristics when friends, family, and those you have trusted fail you on the pathway to your dream. The result of being magnanimous is that you won't sweat the small stuff. That's what happens when you know who you are and when you know where you are headed and you are made for royalty. You are made for destiny. Majestic, is your dream memorable? 
This word says, what value will my dream add to others and to society? Is your dream quantifiable? What great results do you anticipate? How many people will you help? How much income will it generate? What great issue in society are you addressing? Personally, I have a goal to feed and educate 12,000 children daily to improve the lifestyle of 1 billion people through education and training. I want you to think about your goals and then quantify them. Be specific. Is your dream transferable? Who else will benefit from the majestic view of your dream? Is it motivational? Do you get excited about your dream? If you get excited, others will also. The following questions will help you clarify your dream by crafting a vision statement that identifies your destination, your purpose, and your values. Remember these words, transferable, memorable, and motivational. Does your vision statement identify your destination? Where are you going? <laughs> Does your vision statement define your purpose? Why do you exist? What greater good will my vision serve? Does your vision statement convey your values? What principles guide your decisions or actions on your journey? And can your vision be easily captured by your audience? Is it memorable? Use action words and succinct sayings to convey your thoughts. Avoid cliches or overly used statements. And remember this, is your vision motivational? Ask that question because it should be inspiring. If no one is excited about your vision, you may not be effectively communicating. Three short statements come to mind as we close today's action step. Be tenacious towards your goal. Tenacity is a firm grip on the future you have seen with the eye of your faith and in the heart of your imagination. Be gracious. Not everyone is with you on your journey. Certainly many won't believe and some will even question your motivation. Be gracious. You will win them over in the long run. And even if you don't, the fruit of your actions will prove the wisdom of your decisions. With your actions, remember never to sweat the small stuff that goes wrong or the small distractions from the faithless around you. Stay with God, stay on principle, stay focused, be gracious. Today, you can decide. I will be gracious to those who stand in the way of my dream. I will not allow the voice of negativity to halt my dreams. And last, be spacious. Make room for others. Include those you want to take along with you on the journey. No one likes going it alone. Dream big enough to include others in your dream. And when others realize there is room for them, they will join the team. Ask yourself, who can I include? Are you living in a desert or near the vast ocean of abundant possibility? You may be in a desert, but you can see the oasis. Well, we're out of time today. I want you to remember this. One idea from God can change your life forever. I look forward to seeing you on our next episode of Live Your Dream. Thank you for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you here each week on Divinely Inspired Ideas for Life, where one idea from God can change your life forever. Let us hear from you. Tell us how the programs are inspiring your life, and we'd love to pray for you. So connect and let me know what is happening in your life today.